This episode, I'm so excited about Jackson Thomas is a mortgage lender like me who lives in Dallas, Texas, and we're both in the same coaching program. The thing that I really like about Jackson, other than he's just a great human being and we have so much in common, is his story. This guy has gone through so much hardship to get where he's at today, and he really lives to teach his clients, to teach his team, anyone around him, the practical steps to get to a place of being financially free. The guy is a great student. He's humble. And if you met him, you would never know that he's as as successful as he is uh, because the, the man just always wants to learn something. So take a look at this episode. Please make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. Hey, this is the Money Hole Podcast. Please make sure to like, subscribe, and download. Uh, please leave us a comment. Today, I'm here with my good friend, Jackson Thomas. What's up, bud? Hey, what is up, Chris? Honored to be here. Oh, it's so good to be here with you, man. We've been talking about this for a while. And you know, for, for people that are watching, Jackson and I, um, we met through a coaching program that I've been a part of for a long time called The Core. And it's a business coaching program for people that are in the real estate and financial industry, mortgage lenders, and it's changed our lives. And we're going to talk about that, Jackson, because I know it's changed your life too. But what's interesting is just how crazy the world is that Jackson and I were at an event not too long ago and we started talking and we just realized we had so much in common um, with just our history with the church and um, just, you know, even as like Antioch church in Waco, Texas. And, and so, you know, ever since we had that conversation, man, I've, I felt so much more connected to you. And, uh, cause I, I just know that not only are you one of the best lenders in the nation and you serve your clients super well, um, you're incredible for your referral partners, but you also love people and you live with purpose. And so I was really looking forward to connecting with you. So Jackson, besides what I just said, um, let's hear a little bit about your story, man. I, I'd love to hear a little more about, you know, how you got to where you're at today, your, your journey, meeting your wife. And, and we talk a lot about money here, obviously. So I, I thought that would be something really important because of what's going on in the world right now. Um, that the people that hear this are, are getting some practical tips and, and realizing when they look at a guy like you, it's really easy to say, oh, easy for him, but I know it wasn't easy. And I think we want to share that today. So. Ah, well, Chris, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm very inspired uh, and and uh, motivated by just the way you've leveled your business up, right? And I agree. I think um, I'd known who you were and known of you, but I think the conversations we had at the most recent summit where there was just so many mutual connections with, you know, uh, you know, faith, um, church, missions. In fact, we both done like a missionary training school, um, mm-hmm. uh, cancer, IVF, Hawaii. There was just like yeah. so many great connections that yeah. like we, I think have a lot of, I, what I really admire about you is I feel like we, we have similar vision and values. And so like just being able to, you know, connect with someone of your caliber and your character, you know, really helps me feel like, you know, it, it kind of gives you a, a, like a, almost like an injection of like new stamina to kind of survive just because it's, uh, it's a little more taxing in the mortgage industry right now. And so just a little bit. sometimes just sometimes just having someone to grab your arm and say like, hey, you know, keep going. Uh, it's like you push through the wall on a marathon. You know, it's like I feel like I'm hitting mile 20 and it's like I need, you know, sometimes somebody to run with you so you can mm-hmm. finish that that last leg of it. So I'm, I'm glad to be here and happy to help in any way that I can. Awesome, bro. Well, so where t- tell us a little bit about your journey into the mortgage business, because, you know, I don't like, I don't always say this, but I think it's important for people to know, like you're a a wealthy man. Like you are financially in a place where I just have to imagine you, you didn't think you would be at some point in your life. And, and you know, you, you steward wealth and you help people to create it. Um, But I know that you, you know, you didn't get here without a lot of a, a story and I'm interested in that story. Uh, wow. Well, uh, I guess I would put it in the context of, you know, uh, before the core, right? So that's our connecting point. So I would say before the core was like probably 2016 at that time in my life, uh, I was, 
I would say like before core, I would say I was very scared, right? Like I was operating from a place of fear, um, mm -hmm. married, had a kid, um, and was trying to find a way to provide for my family. At that time, I was a mortgage recruiter. So I knew of the core a little bit because of that. Uh, but in 2016, the company that I was working for, which my, was my brother's mortgage company, um, you know, the day after he got married, so he's on his honeymoon, it's a Sunday, uh, we get an email from our warehouse line that all the warehouse lines have been cut and uh, we have 150 loans funding that next week and we're out of business. Like, so it's yeah. like, so he has to come back from his honeymoon. He, we sell the company or he sells his company to SWBC um, in March of 2016. And I'm like, oh, I got to figure my, like, I, so I decided to get licensed um, in July of 2016. Um, and then, you know, from that point forward, I got involved with the course. So the moment I got licensed, I started filling out the the core, like greatness tracker. And so like, because of my experience as a mortgage recruiter, I'd heard of this thing. And I, like, when I was starting, mm -hmm. I was like, I need something, I need a system or a process. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so the core has been instrumental in my life. I mean, if I go from where I was at that point of, you know, I, I'm fearful about my job situation because I no longer had a salary. I was fearful about the company I was at. Um, <clears throat> like, just like your story, like my wife and I, we were trying to have a baby. It, I, it, without the core, without mortgage business, I wouldn't have a second daughter. It cost us probably about, you know, $70,000 to have our second kid. And so I needed to make money you know? Yeah. And so I was very motivated at that time in my life. And so the core has created an opportunity for me to really make the most of a lot of opportunities in the mortgage industry that I wouldn't have, you know, I, I've been able to see opportunities capitalize on them and learn fundamentals that help me really save and earn and, and give in big ways and super yeah. grateful for that. Yeah. So when I got in the core, I was, it was a little bit different. It was, I was actually doing fairly well, at least by my standards at that time but I, I didn't know how to save money. You know, I came from a family who just spent everything that they made. And, and, and I just knew because I had recently had cancer and almost spent my last dollar to try to keep our house that like that feeling of fear of not being able to take care of my wife and man, that feeling, it was a feeling I never wanted to have again, but you know, like everybody, I didn't know what to do. Like, I didn't know what a budget looked like. I had no, never had anyone model that for me. And so the second motivation for me was I was so stressed out. I was working so many hours and I had sticky notes all over my desk. I had, you know, everybody calling me from 6 a.m. till 12 o'clock at night. And I felt like if I didn't take their call, I'm going to go out of business. And so when I saw that there was actually a group that said, we can help you. We can show you how to create structure in your business so that you can actually stay married and not do drugs, which is what a lot of people do that are entrepreneurs. Um, and I had been sober at the time, five or six years. Um, and we're going to teach you how to take the money you make and put it into investments and to live on a budget, not so that you have this limited life, but so that you can actually create something um, where you're able to, you know, at some point in your life, not have to ever feel like that again. And so for me, that was my biggest motivation. Um, I think we all come to the core or some sort of a business coaching thing for different reasons. And, but what we all find is it, it, it all centers around money management, time management, and figuring out, um, what it is you really want in life. Well, a hundred percent, man. I mean, I think your story is incredibly inspiring just with whatever you were, you know, been able to overcome with cancer. It's unbelievable, man. And so, uh, definitely, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think that should give you a lot of confidence and hope that like, you know, it's kind of like, no matter what knocks you down, there's a, you know, the only way you stay down is if you, you know, stay down, like just being able to get up, if you can survive cancer, you can survive 8% interest rates. You can survive a couple bad months, you know? Yeah. And so it's, it's true, it, man. It, it's true. And I, I think that's something good to talk about, you know, confidence, because, you know, right now, um, we're, when we're recording this, there's a war in the Middle East, there's mass shootings, 8% interest rates, inflation, we're heading into an election, and a lot of people are carrying a massive, a massive amount of fear, you know, especially... I mean, in our industry, real estate, mortgage, I mean, we haven't seen a market like this for, I mean, they're talking about 20 to 30 years, maybe longer. 
And this is so different than 2008. This is, you know, we're having a crash in inventory, a crash in transactions. It's not that values, at least at this point, have dipped at all in most markets. It's that yeah, I agree. The people just aren't buying houses. The market is at a standstill. The only people buying are people that have to or people that are not affected by it. But the average person, it's just they're priced out of the market. Uh, not so bad in Texas where you live, but in California, it's really difficult. And so, you know, I was talking with a friend of mine on a hunting trip recently. I went up there with Oleg and my friend Josh and we were just, we were chatting through the market and, and these are guys who are also, you know, totally in a place where they could retire. And so they're, they're not feeling the, the pressure of living paycheck to paycheck anymore. But this is what my friend said to me. He said, no matter what, no matter where you're at over the next year, maybe longer, you're going to have some pain and you're going to have to figure out how to grow and how to do things differently. And I think that the, the good thing about your story and what you've gone through with the company shutting down, with having to learn a new business overnight to take care of your family and, and to figure out how to have a kid on my story and a lot of the guys we run with is if you run into those problems, it's not that you don't have fear. It's just that you you know that you're going to probably figure it out and you surround yourself with people uh, that will help you do it. And then what happens is you end up building resilience where when you're facing a market like this, it's just because you have money or anyone else I know, it doesn't mean that they're looking at this market and sitting in their chair and laughing like, oh, this is no big deal. I mean, we still have to deal with it. You have people working for you that literally depend on you to create income so that you can help them keep their jobs. Like that is a really big pressure. That's a big motivator, right? And you have a company that you have to stay profitable for. And, and so I, I think it's important that people know that even people that are in a, a position of financial freedom, like they still have to feel the same emotions. They just know what to do in times like this. And they don't sit around and think about it too much. They get into action. Wouldn't you agree with that? I 100% agree with that. And I actually think you articulated that really well in that we all face fear. But I think what I've learned from being around successful people and being, you know, through whether it's sales training or business training is there's things that I've been able to hold on tools. I've been able to learn to kind of put in my tool belt. Like, for example, one thing that comes to mind when you're talking about it is like, I, I have this mantra. It's like action cures fear, action cures fear. So like when I run into situations of fear, just like, like I feel like, okay, Hey, I know what's going to happen is I need to take some action. So mm -hmm. I know I'm going to write some stuff down. I also was taught like when you have problems, you write them down and you write down the steps, like what's the next step I can do. So rather than being like overwhelmed with it, which I think is very normal and understandable, like some people just shut down, they go into a defense mechanism. I feel like my defense mechanism with fear or problems is okay. Lean into it, like lean into it. Okay. Okay. Let's just like head on face on. Don't put your head in the sand. Let's deal with it right now. So it's like, I feel like there was another thing I learned in sales is like, it's like the do it now principle. So it's like, Hey, if it takes less than five minutes, do it right now. Do not procrastinate. So it's like, now if it takes like, if it's like a huge project then maybe you break it out, but it's like, just get something done right now. Like an mm -hmm. iterative process. It doesn't have to be perfect. Get something done right now. Take a first step, a first version and get it out, get it going. And, um, I think you're exactly right. Like, I think sometimes people maybe who haven't been, around successful people or maybe haven't been, a, you know, given proper training by their company or, or by their parents or by their school, they get very debilitated by fear and it shuts them mm -hmm. down. And the only tool they have in their tool belt is, um, put my head in the sand or, yeah. um, shut down emotionally or mentally because it's like, I'm overwhelmed. So I just give up. Uh, and, and so I'm grateful for like the mentors in my life who helped me get those tools in my tool belt over the year. Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit about mentors, but you know, going back to the fear thing, I heard a long time ago someone say, you can't think your way into right living, you have to live your way into right thinking. And so what that means is if you have belief systems, fear, um, limiting belief systems or fear, and you think that you're going to read a book and sit there and try to solve the problem, like you're wrong. You have to get out of your chair and go do something. And even if what you do isn't the right thing, you're going to cancel, you're going to scratch one thing off the list that wasn't the right thing. And you're one step closer to the right thing. And, 
And, and I have to remember that all the time, man. I mean, I learned that years ago in AA, you know, they talk, they, yeah. they quote the, the Bible scripture that faith without works is dead. Like if you don't do the work, you don't get the result. And it, courage is, you know, you've heard it before. Courage isn't the absence of fear. It's getting your ass up and doing the work, even though you're afraid and just going for it. It's like, and I, and I think that the cool thing is, is, you know, a guy like you, you ha- and you've done this for a while. So now you have this this bag of, of experience, exponential, uh, experiential wisdom where you can look back in hard times and you can just see these places like God did not let me down. That action did not let me down. That situation where I thought I was going to fail miserably. It was actually me being protected from something that would have been bad for me, or it was a breakthrough into something that was better for me. And so I think that's that resilience that that people that live this way get. And the reason why people think they're so confident, they they still have fear, but they just know that fear isn't going to be the end. And oftentimes it puts them in a better spot in life. Fear is a lie. Fear is a misuse of imagination, right? I, I think as believers, for me, like, I would say one of the gifts, there's a lot of things I am, I'm not great at. Um, I'm a terrible driver, um, but I am, I don't have fear. And, and what I mean by that is like, I've learned how to manage it in a much more reasonable way. Like I feel like it's a superpower. Fear causes me to get into action in a very powerful, positive way. And there's a Bible, like some, I hold on to like the Bible has 365 verses that say, do not fear. So to me, like fear is a sin. Like, and I say that as a way to kind of like, get myself, like you said, the right thinking. Like, I don't want to let myself entertain those thoughts. I will take every thought captive, make it obedient to Christ. Like, I'm going to throw that out. Like, that is not truth. I may be emotionally feeling fearful, but like, I also know I can step into faith and say, like, I'm going to believe better things. Like, I'm going to choose to not rely on my feelings in this moment, but like, I'm going to push through and find the solution. Like, there's there, it's like no trial is pleasant at the time, but it yields a harvest of righteousness. So it's like, there, this is just a trial. Like it's going to make me stronger. It's like doing a rep. It's a mental rep. Okay. I'm doing some bench press. I'm doing a curl. And it's just a curl of, uh, like this is a very difficult conversation I have to have with someone, but I'm going to do it right. Rather than shrinking back and just not lifting the weight. Um, so I, I like what you say there, like, and fear is something I really, I, I don't know, like that's, um, something I'm, I'm passionate about trying to like impart to other people because mm-hmm. I, I know that's a reality for a lot of people that, that, that yeah. it's a, fear is a very overwhelming thing and they just, you know, maybe don't know how to get past it. Um, and it just comes yeah. maybe a little bit easier to me. Well, it's a powerful emotion. Um, you know, fear is a real thing and the emotion of fear in itself is not bad. I mean, if you're standing on the top of Mount Everest and look over the edge and you feel fear, that's there for a reason. Um, so you don't fall and die. Right. But if you're sitting in your bed and it's 12 o'clock at night and you feel anxiety in your chest because you're thinking about work, even though you have plenty of food in the fridge and your bills were paid that month, that's when fear has now become a character defect, right? And and so I I think there's a couple acronyms for fear. You probably heard these before. Uh, the first one is false evidence appearing real. I'm sure you've heard that one. Um, I heard this guy recently say that fear is faith in the wrong thing. That was a really good one. And this one's the best one. Fear is fuck everything and run. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think a lot of people in the mortgage world might might be deferring more to that one right now. That's the one for a lot of people in real estate right now. It's also the first time I've said an f bomb on camera, so I got a thumbs up from Tab. <laughs> just just do a um, little bleep, you know. Boop. Um, so let, let's talk a little bit about mentorship, man. It never ceases uh, to amaze me that every time I have someone, uh, you know, in this podcast that has done anything great in their life, it always comes down to some people relationships. People they met that opened their mind, that pulled them up the mountain. And so I'd love to hear about your journey with some mentors or a mentor. And then I think what we want to do is wrap it up. Uh, Jackson, with with just talking to to people right now that are dealing with the problems in the world and the advice that you and I are giving those people right now. Yeah, I would say, you know, tying into the advice and mentor is seeking mentors out and you 
taking the initiative, right? Like I think one-on-one mentorship is you're just lucky and you're blessed that someone takes an interest in you. Could be your parents, could be a teacher, could be a coach. Mm -hmm. Um, I had different people like that in my life. Also at a church, there was an older guy uh, that took interest in me. Um, After school, there was a a job and a manager who took a direct interest in me and became more of a coach, more than even just a boss. And I'm super grateful for those people. But I think, you know, if you haven't had that, um, you know, I would say a, a step you could take is to take the initiative to seek out mentors mm-hmm. and to call them. Like what I've learned from being around Rick and is that he's like, call me, seek me out. The people that want to be mentored by me are seeking me out. So it's like, he's like, so I just got in the habit. I like, call him every Friday at two o'clock. And it's like, I maybe only get three minutes, five minutes, whatever, but I get that time. And it's like, and then like, I will fly out to see him and I will spend mm-hmm. time with him. So I think that would be what I've learned in mentorship is you get out of it what you put into it, right? Yeah. Even for the people that are like, it's like, hey, that coach shows up and is like, obviously in your life, but if you come to practice and you're really ready to go, ready to listen, ready to say, hey, here's what you said last time we got together. Or if you're in business, it's like, hey, manager, we had a breakfast meeting a month ago. You said these three things I've worked on them. Let me tell you about the progress I've made since our last conversation. You know, giving your mentor honor and showing that you have a real interest is I think partly why maybe I've gotten more out of mentorship is taking yeah. a little more of an ownership and an initiative. And people that gave me that advice, I don't think I did that initially, but then I was taught like, take initiative, take notes, be interested in the other person, give them honor. And then you all of a sudden see that relationship flourish. And I think that is true of a lot of relationships. And you could do that yeah. with your wife, you can do that with your kids, um, you can do that with your friends. Like if you, you know, uh, people that are interested in other people and, you know, are intentional, I think just have better relationships. Every single person that we are in relationship with has something for us to learn. And one of the things I love about you, Jackson, is there has not been a single coaching call that I can remember. Maybe there's been some that I didn't see where I haven't seen you pen to paper taking notes when someone's talking. And it's not just the coach, like you're listening. And if something is valuable, you're writing it down. So this has been great, Jackson. So you know, the, the listeners of this podcast, um, all 5 million of them are generally 25 to 45 year old middle to upper middle class people. So these are the clients you and I are serving, dealing with some real problems right now. Um, let's talk about just a couple tips that we can give people right now, besides removing fear from their life. Hopefully we made that abundantly clear, doing that at all cost, finding mentors, but some really practical things that people can do on a financial side of things, because that's what you and I do for a living, uh, to get themselves in the best position to navigate whatever's ahead. And I don't know what's ahead, neither do you, right? But you know, we should always prepare for the worst and hope for the best. A hundred percent. So I would say practical advice that has been meaningful to me that I would share is you have to do a budget. You have to do a written budget. You have to sit down with your spouse and you have to go over it and you have to compare what is my standard and what is my actual spending? Like, don't just set a goal, set a standard. Like, this is how much we're going to spend in this area. And if you cannot hold yourself to that standard, go to a cash envelope system. Like I did that for a while until I got myself under control. Right. So I, it, it's, it's a fundamental, it's not sexy. No, like everyone knows this 80% of finance is behavioral, not knowledge. You know, people know what they should be doing. They just don't do it. So then I would say if you're in that camp where you're not willing to immediately, as soon as you hear this, go and like work on your budget and set up a, a budget meeting with your spouse and go through it together or with, or maybe with a friend if you're single and say, let's hold each other accountable to our budget to actually spending less. You have to spend at least only 80% of how much money you make. You've got to be able to be saving and investing. Ideally, you're giving if you're a person of faith, but like find a way to live on 80% of your money you know, as a a minimum, right? Um, The more you can cut, like it's not how much money you make, it's how much money you keep. And the best, most wealthy people are the ones that keep their living expenses low and create that margin of like, they're not just living on 80% of their income, they're maybe living on 50% of their income. And they're able to like invest a lot more, give a lot more, save a lot more, you know? And so 
I think you've got to have a budget. You have to have an emergency fund. You have to be intentional about getting out of debt. You have to be getting into real estate. You've got to be preparing for upcoming expenses, whether that's a wedding, a car, or college for your kids. You have to be investing in retirement. Like you have to be doing a minimum of 15% of your 401k. And these are must. And the thing is, the people that are the ones that are going to succeed are the ones that are going to say, yes, I take your advice and I'm going to implement. The ones that try to make an excuse or say it's difficult or I can't do it. Like I don't make enough money to like actually save, you know, put 15% in retirement uh, is, you know, what I would say is where there's a will, there's a way. If it's important to you, you will make it happen. If it's not important to you, you find an excuse. Mm -hmm. And so I would just say like, that's what mentors have done for me is like, Rick will yell at me. You have to save 20%. Like, and if I show my budget, he's like, you know, it's like in that level of accountability has changed my entire life. Like, and so I, yeah, it's not, it's not pleasant, but like, you've got to lean into it. And this would be some of my pointers for people. Yeah. And if you really want to like, think through your excuses, I, I was given an analogy that's not very pleasant and could offend some people, but it worked for me not too long ago. Uh, someone said early in my career, when I was, you know, not thinking I could do certain things, they said, listen to me. They said, for you to get out of this mess, you have to do this kind of work every day for like 90 days. And you know what it's like going through some of these boot camps and stuff. Like the amount of work that we're asked to do, it seems not possible. It's like so much work than what anyone would expect for us to do to the point where when I share it with my friends, a lot of times they're like, they think I'm crazy. And he said, this will solve your problems. And he said, and, and le if you don't think you can do it, let me just put it to you this way. He said, if I put a gun up to one of your most precious loved one's head and I said, in 90 days, you don't do this work, they're gone. Do you think you would get it done? I said, yeah. He's like, so that just tells you that it's just not important enough to you. It's not that you can't do it. It's that you're not willing to do it. And until you come to grips with that, you never will. And 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 so I just think you said something so important is like people need to they need to use whatever it takes, uh, whether that's getting into coaching, whether that's accountability with a friend group where you talk about these things and you get really vulnerable and you show them your finances. We have a friend group and we've been talking about doing that. Like some guys are struggling. I say, hey, man, we got a bunch of business people here. Why don't you come and just show us everything? And one of these guys did it and it's really helping them to gain clarity. He's actually living really well on a small amount. He just needs to make more money. And, and so I just think that community coaching accountability, um, those are some really practical things you can do. If you feel like you don't actually have it in you to change the behavior, pull other people in, that's the secret. So, so Jackson, man, I so appreciate you for making time. I know it's late in Texas, bro, but I know a lot of people will get a ton out of this and, uh, thank you so much, my friend. Absolutely. It was an honor. Cool, man. Have a good evening, my friend. <laughs>